But anyways, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Lamentations chapter 2. Lamentations is in the Old Testament. Uh, You might have to use the front of your Bible to find it. You might not spend much time in Lamentations because it's a very depressing book. Um, But it's a timely and good book. But we have finished our series on 1 Corinthians after being in it for over a year. And uh, it's been a wonderful time, and today we're just going to take a Sunday in between series and do a one-off on something that God has laid upon my heart, but also next week we're going to jump into the book of Titus, and we're going to look at what makes a healthy church a healthy church, what makes a healthy Christian a healthy Christian, and how are we to live counterculturally as Christians. That's all going to start next week, and that's going to take us right to the summer, and then we're going to spend the summer in the Psalms, and then I have a fun series for us in the fall where we're going to answer some of Christianity's toughest questions. So it's going to be a fun time, but for now we're in Lamentations. And today is a Sunday I want to speak about a subject that I know many of us at many times wrestle with in our lives. Because it seems to me, and I could be wrong, but it would, it would go against everything in my conversations with you guys, that it has been very hard for many of you for many months now. There's been random suffering and pain has plagued your life in these times when we go through these hardships in our lives, we can start to believe the fundamental lie that God is against us. That even God is our enemy. Why is all this bad stuff happening in my life? What is going on? So I just want to warn you, if you're here and you're not a Christian, this is going to be a very difficult message to hear. If you're here and you have skepticism about church, this is going to be a very difficult message to hear because we're going to look at the very nature of who God is. And that's a picture that's quite frightening sometimes. So we're going to wade into these uncomfortable waters together. You've heard me teach here before, mainly when we go through the Psalms, something that I call the dark side of God's will. Now, I didn't coin that phrase, the dark side of God's will. And no, I'm not talking about a a, a music album, you know, the dark side of the moon. I'm talking about the dark side of God's will. And and it's one, uh, an area that's not spoken about often. But talking about the dark side of God's will is an attempt for me to create a metaphor for those certain seasons of life in the midst of difficulty, it feels that God has abandoned you, that he's left you. You're on the dark side of God's will. And so how I describe the dark side of God's will, and it's really relevant now, it's that you're in those moments when you're in the orbit of God's will, but for a moment, you're in a place where the warm glow of his promise-keeping grace is eclipsed by difficulty, confusion, and pain. Being on the dark side of God's will doesn't change the certainty of the providential orbit, the presence of his promise-filled son, yet the eclipse creates an environment where it feels cold, feels dark, and it feels lonely. My brother who lives in Ontario, he got to experience total um, e- the total eclipse, uh, what is that called? Total coverage, or totality, thank you. He got to experience totality, and he explained it in the sense where it went dark, The birds stop chirping. The temperature drops. And that's what it's like to be on the dark side of God's will. Your pain, your problems, your suffering for a moment seem to eclipse God. And it feels for a moment that you're in the cold, dark, you're lonely. The birds stop chirping. And you feel alone. You know one day that the sun will shine again. But it seems like a long ways off when you're on the dark side of God's will. Now, I don't know if that captures for what you have seen or what you have experienced in your life, but I know it certainly captures at least the moments in my life when I have wondered, God, I know you have a plan for my life. I intellectually understand that you are for me and not against me. You have a sovereign plan for my life, but right now, God, it feels like you have turned your back on me. That should make you feel uncomfortable, but it's a felt reality. It feels like I am all alone. And that concept is helpful to me when I need to trust who God is. That he is working out a bigger plan than I could ever think of or imagine or come up with. That even when life is hard, it's the sovereignty of God, which is a nice big word for that God is in control. God is not caught off guard. That even in my pain, in my confusing times, even when life seems flat out unfair... 
God is sovereign. Amen, church? And we need to anchor ourselves to that. And in the same ways that we need the bigness of God's sovereignty and God's plan and how it informs us as we see circumstances in life that are difficult and challenging, so the bigness of God's holiness must be seen and held in order to inform us how we see the problem of sin. Not just the problem of sin in the world, but let's make this personal. The problem of sin within my own life within your own life. So when life becomes confusing, that's when you need a high view of God. You always do, I would argue. And, and you need his view and, that re- and his plan, and that really matters. But when you see the effects of sin in the world, when you see the consequences of sin in the world, that's also when your view of God really matters. R- really matters. When you look back on history, when you read through the Old Testament, and you see the judgment of God, being poured out against sin. Your view of God at that moment matters. How you interpret what is going on is directly related to how big your vision of God is. And a lot of us as Western Christians have a very, very small view of God. Very small. And in the same way that you need a big vision of God when life is confusing, you also need a big vision of God when life has consequences. R.C. Sproul has famously said many times that the, the, the major issue that is facing the Western world, the Western church, is that we have forgotten primarily who God is and who we are. God is holy, and we are not. And we like to flip the two. We like to view God as small. And that has devastating effects on our lives. So here's my question. What is your view of God as it relates to his holiness and sovereignty, his control, his in charge? For that matter, how big is God to you? How different is he from you? And then how does that affect your perspective on sin? How does that affect how you view your own sin? How does that affect how you labor in prayer? And for that matter, how you do something that's called lament. I would suggest to you that the lament The art of lament helps us with the big picture in view of God. That lament helps tune our hearts to the glory of God. A lament helps us to hear the symphony of God and his holiness and his righteousness, even if it's in a minor key. So you might be wondering, well, what is lament? Well, lament which is the word lamentations coming from, is a heartfelt cry as a believer pours out their hearts to God in prayer. It's a really messy prayer, but it's an important prayer. It serves Christians as an interpreter. So think of it. Something's happened to you, something unfair, a bad doctor's report, somebody being rude to you, you losing a loved one. Anything can go in this category. Something happens to you that you are struggling with, and lament serves as the thing that interprets that. So you get underneath it, and you see what's causing it, and you get over top of it from a 30,000-foot view, so you see God's plan to totality. That's what lament does. It brings us a reminder of who God is in the face of suffering and pain. It won't necessarily change your situation, but it will drive you closer to the who of God, which will eventually eclipse your problems. In other words, what it's looking for what the root is, what happens, and it's looking for the ultimate resolution for that pain, for that suffering, for that question in your life. And the ultimate resolution for all those pains, all those questions, the ultimate resolution for what we're about to read in these 22 verses is the same place. And it's found in the cross. Deep Clouds and Dark Mercy, it's a book written on lament, and I would commend every single Christian to read this book. He says that lament, or to cry is human, but to lament is inherently Christian. Lament is inherently Christian because lament from a Christian perspective is one of the most theologically rich things that we can do. 
And it ought to be one of the most theological rich things we can do because what it does is when we think about God, what we think about God and what we think about ourselves surfaces in the moments when we see the righteousness of God being leveled against sin or when we see the suffering that we are facing, when we get hit by suffering. Who we view God is and who we view as ourselves comes to the forefront. Think of it like this. Your life is like a beaker. You know, a science lab, they have beakers. And the beaker is full of solution. And at the bottom of that beaker is a bunch of sediment that has settled. And when suffering comes in your life, it's sort of like your beaker gets bumped. God bumps your beaker, and then all that sediment starts shooting up. So before you seem to appear in righteous and good and clean, but then your beaker gets bumped, and all that sediment pollutes the, the, the solution. And then in those moments, you can't believe what's coming out of your mouth. I hear this from Christians all the time. I thought I had a handle on this, and then X, Y, Z happened. I can't believe I popped my cork. I can't believe what was flowing out of my mouth. I can't believe what I was wrestling with inside of my heart. I can't believe the challenges and issues that I'm facing. Because when you face suffering, when you face hardship, it shows you what you truly believe, what is truly inside of you. This is why the New Testament talks a lot about the refining of metal as a process of the Christian life because the metal gets melted down and burned down and all the impurities float to the top and they're scooped off so the metal is stronger. That's the point of suffering. That's the point of looking at the hard things of the Bible because they bring the sediment up. They bring the sediment up. So you might be good at pretending when life is easy, but as soon as your beaker gets bumped, part of that trauma is that you get to look in the mirror and you see yourself who you really are. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when that mirror hits me, I don't like, I don't like what I see. But those moments are important. What you can do with them is you either go, well, okay, or you deal with it. That's part of suffering is dealing with the, the things that are still keeping you from God and removing them from your life, scooping them out of the metal and throwing them away. So when it hardens again, it's stronger and it's integrity. So with that, what we're going to do is look at Lamentations chapter 2. We're going to read all 22 verses together. And let me just warn you, these are some heavy verses. They're not going to be on the screen for you because they're long. Um, but I want you to be in your Bible or at least listening to me read them. So with that, Lamentations chapter 2. Let's go through from verse 1 to 22 and then we'll walk through some of the verses. How the Lord in his anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. He has cast down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. He has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. The Lord has swallowed up without mercy all the inhabitants of Jacob. In his wrath he has broken down the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He has brought down to the ground in dishonor the kingdom and its rulers. He has cut down in fierce anger all the might of Israel. He has withdrawn from them his right hand in the face of the enemy. He has burned like a flaming fire in Jacob, consuming all around. He has bent his bow like an enemy, with his right hand set like a foe, and he has killed all who delighted in our eyes in the tent of the daughter of Zion. He has poured out his fury like fire. The Lord has become like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all its palaces. He has laid its, in ruin its strongholds, and he has multiplied in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. He has laid waste to its booth like a garden, laid in ruins his meeting place. The Lord has made Zion forget festival and Sabbath, and in his fierce indignation has spurned king and priest. The Lord has scorned his altar and disowned his sanctuary. He has delivered into the hand of the the enemy, the walls of her palaces, they raised a clamor in the house of the Lord as on the day of a festival. The Lord determined to lay in ruins the wall of the daughter of Zion. He is stretched out like a measuring line. He did not restrain his hand from destroying. He has caused rampant and wall to lament. They languish together. Her gates have sunken in the ground. He has ruined and broken her bars. Her king and her princes are among the nations. The law is no more, and her prophets find no vision from the Lord. The elders of the daughter of Zion sit on the ground in silence. They have thrown dust on their, on their heads and put on sackcloth. The young women of Jerusalem have bowed their heads to the ground. My eyes are spent with weeping. My stomach churns. My bile is poured out on the ground because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. Because in 
infants and babies faint in the streets of the city. The cry of their mothers, where is any wine, are, are as they faint like a wounded man in the streets of the city as their life is poured out, out on their mother's bosoms. What can I say for you to who compare, O daughter of Jerusalem? What can I liken to you that I may com comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? Your prophets have seen your false and deceptive visions. They have not exposed your iniquity to restore your fortunes, but have seen for you oracles that are false and misleading. All who pass along the way clap their hands at you. They hiss and wag their heads at the daughter of Jerusalem. In this city that we called the perfection of beauty, the joy of all the earth. All your enemies rail against you. They hiss, they gnash their teeth, they cry. We have swallowed her. Oh, this is the day we long for. Now we have it, we see it. The Lord has done what he has purposed. He has carried out his word, which he commanded long ago. He has thrown down without pity. He has made the enemy rejoice over you and exalted the might of your foes. Their heart cried to the Lord, O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears stream down like a torrent day and night. Give yourself no rest, your eyes no respite. Arise out of the night. At the beginning of the night watches, pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift your hands to him for the, uh, for the lives of your children who faint for hunger at the head of every street. Look, O Lord, and see with whom have you dealt thus. Should women eat the fruit of their womb, the children of their tender care? Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? In the dust of the streets lie the young and the old. My young women and my young men have fallen by the sword. You have killed them in the day of your anger, slaughtering without pity. You summoned as if in the festival day of terrors on every side, and on the day of the anger the Lord. No one escaped or survived. Those whom I held and raised, my enemy destroyed. Wow. Wow. Some of you, as that text was being read, you're thinking, wow, those are 22 heavy verses. And you're right. And maybe you're thinking in the back of the rhyme, my breath, oh my word, this is such a depressing Sunday. Why did I choose to come? Others of you heard and your heart didn't go there, but instead you, you trembled because you're like, this is really what a holy God is like. And what lament does is it reminds us that God is merciful and he is kind and he is gracious. Please understand me that God is here and he is ready to forgive you of your sins, but he is also a holy God and he is just and he should be feared. He should be feared. So there is another side to grace. And grace is only amazing because wrath is real. Grace, grace is only amazing because God's judgment is real. Gra or judgment, wrath, is like the felt backdrop that a jeweler uses to put a ring on so the diamond pops under all the lights. When you put the ring on, you go, this is the most beautiful ring I've ever seen because of that felt backdrop that pulls all the light to the diamond. God's wrath, God's judgment is that felt backdrop that pulls to the diamond of God's grace that shows us crystal clear how amazing grace is because how extreme his wrath is because he is a holy and righteous God. And that statement should both make you rejoice on this side of the cross, but also it should make you tremble. I think Christians should have in their hearts a frightening joy, a frightening joy. And Lamentations 2 is a poem that is about the glory of God in judgment, the glory of God in judgment. And what you need to know about Lamentations 2 is that there is no happy ending to this chapter. It doesn't go, oh, and by the way, they lived happily ever after, Woohoo! And I'm thankful it doesn't do that. Because I know for many of you, there's days and weeks and months and maybe even years where there has been no resolution to your suffering, to your pain. And it leaves us in this moment of tension as we wait for Jesus to come, as, as Dan read in worship, to come and rescue us, to wipe away every tear, to remove all pain, amen? Because there are many days or weeks where we just feel so alone, but we know with faith that he is coming. 
So what I want to do is go through some of these verses and connect us to the ultimate resolution of these 22 verses and the ultimate resolution of your pain, your suffering, and your questions of why, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the cross of Christ. How does Lamentations 2 and the cross intersect together? Well, we're going to find out on this journey. And the first way we're going to do so is talking about the wrath of God. The first 10 verses are a poetic expression of what the judgment of God is like as it relates to the city of Jerusalem. So just a quick contextual note. In the year 586 BC, the city of Jerusalem was absolutely leveled. God warned the people of Israel over and over and over again, knock it off, repent, come back to me, and I will not send the curses from the covenant that you have taken with me. But they didn't. They kept going. And so they were faced with the judgment of God. So that's the setting we're working with. So Lamentations 2 is a poetic expression of what the prophet Jeremiah sees as he looks at the burning city of Jerusalem. The first word of the first verse is the word how. And I think that's such an appropriate word. How. That could be a cry of a question or a cry of pain, coming, struggling to come to terms with what is going on around them in the city. How, God, how did this happen? How did we get here? But it also serves as the, the title for the entire book of Lamentations. How. How did we let this happen? Chapter 2 has 22 verses, as does chapter 21, and both of them correlate with the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And every verse in the 22 verses start with the subsequent Hebrew letter. And there's lots of uh, opinion why that happens, but my opinion is it's in, it's in order to communicate to us that God's judgment is complete in total from A to Z, if we're going to use the English, trans, or English uh, alphabet. It's complete in its scope. From A to Z. So verse 1 serves as the theme to the entire chapter, which says, How the Lord in his anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. He has cast down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. He has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. So I want you to notice a couple things in this first verse. The first thing I want you to notice is the Lord is angry. The Lord is angry. Are you okay with that? That's a very uncomfortable picture. Are you okay with that? It's real. The God of the universe, the creator of the world, the one who holds righteousness in the very essence of his being can be and is justifiably and righteously angry with the presence of sin in his created world. Secondly, although the people of God are precious to him and still are, they're described as the daughter of Zion after all. They're put under a cloud, this verse says. So what is that cloud? Well, that cloud is the cloud of judgment. What more? The glory of the people has fallen. He has cast down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. So what was the glory of Israel is now gone. It's been extinguished, and his people have been displaced. They're among the nations. Finally, he talks about the footstool, which refers to the temple and the city. And he's saying it's no longer remembered. It seems as though that God has forgotten the temple, the people. God has withdrawn his hand of blessing. And then the rest of the chapter paints a relentless picture of God's wrath against the nation. Looking at verse three to, 2 to 3, what I want you to notice as we go there is all the verbs that he uses. It's important to pay attention to verbs because they give you color and action to what you're reading. So Jeremiah doesn't just want to tell you that the city's destroyed. He wants to tell you that it's been swallowed up. He wants to amplify what you feel. And so he uses pointed and powerful language. Verses 2 to 3 says, The Lord has swallowed up without mercy all the inhabitants of Jacob. In his wrath, he has broken down the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He has brought down to the ground and dishonored the kingdom and its rulers. He has cut down in fierce anger all the might of Israel. He has withdrawn from them in his right hand in the, fear, in the face of the enemy. He has burned like a flaming fire in Jacob, consuming all around. You get the point. Verb after verb after verb after verb. He wants you to see this from various angles and points that the city of Jerusalem has been leveled. The, the, the temple has been destroyed. The people are no longer there. They're off in exile. He wants you to know the extent of this destruction, how bad it is, and there's something else he wants you to know as well. And this is the hard part. Verse 2 says, The Lord has swallowed up without mercy. 
He wants you to know that God is the one who is behind this judgment. The Babylonian army was just the means, but at the end of the day, it was God who was behind it. He didn't just allow it, but the verses say he's purposed it. Now, I know that all raises all sorts of questions in your mind. And I could stand here and answer all those questions for you theologically. You can never answer these questions emotionally, but you can answer them theologically. But that's not the point of this text. That's for a coffee one day to talk about. But what Jeremiah wants you to do and what I want you to do is just to leave the text where it is and just sit in that and realize that it was God who was behind this judgment. The Babylon army was the judgment of a holy and righteous God. Now jump down to verses 6 and we'll come back to verses 4 and 5 in a moment. It says in verse 6, he laid to waste Uh, We see that, sorry, this judgment extends to their worship. He laid to waste the booth of their garden. He lays and ruins his meeting place. The Lord has made Zion forget festival and Sabbath. And in the face, in in his fierce indignation, he has spurned king and priest. The Lord has scorned his altar, disowned his sanctuary. He has delivered it into the hand of the enemy. The walls of her palaces, they have raised a clamor in the house of the Lord as on the day of a festival. Okay, so what you need to see here is what Jeremiah is saying is the very holy temple of God where there used to be congregations of people who were worshiping God and providing sacrifices to God is no longer happening. It's done right now. And instead, in its place is like a day of a festival. People celebrating with spears and swords saying, we have victory over God and his people. We have destroyed God and his people. So where there used to be worship of the holy God, there is now just the clamors of a nation that is anti-God, saying we have had victory over Yahweh. That's the image that, that I've been preaching on Paul so much. I almost said Paul. That's the image that Jeremiah wants you to see, and I'm sure Paul would too. The protection is gone. We see this in verses 8 to 10. We're not going to read them, but it describes that the walls are broken down. The gates have sunken, right? The city is entirely exposed. Verses 9 and 10 also show us that the culture is ruined. We see that the kings and the princes are, are, are gone. They're, they're, they're no more. Her prophets find no visions, metaphorically communicating that the heavens, they're closed. God is no longer speaking. God is... He's no longer showing up. He's no longer giving them word. He's no longer giving them vision and instruction on how to be the people of God. Heaven is silent. They're crying out, God, hear us from heaven, and there's nothing. How many of you felt like that before? The priests no longer hear from God. The elders are sitting in silence. The women are weeping. The picture is everything. Absolutely everything is ruined. Everywhere you look, there is just utter destruction. That's the image that Jeremiah wants you to see. Now back to verses 4 and 5. We won't read the whole things, but I want you to pick out um, a couple words here. It says, he's bent down like, uh, he, he, sorry, he has bent his bow like an enemy. And then verse 5, it says, the Lord has become like an enemy. Now, depending on your translation, there's a few words you need to catch. It's either words like seems, like, or feels. Depending on your translation, that's very important. Because what he's saying is, in this moment, God feels like an enemy. He feels like he is against me. But at the end of the day, feels is an important word. Or like is an important word because he is not an enemy. He is not against them. It feels like in this little moment that God is their enemy, but the ultimate end game of God is to discipline his people, to awaken their hearts, and to bring them back to him. So he's not their enemy, but he is their God. And that's important because Israel entered into a covenant relationship with God, and God said, here's all the blessings that I will give you as my covenant people. But on top of that, here are the curses you will receive if your heart runs from me. And what did they do? They left God. And God didn't just send judgment. He's a patient and loving God. He sent warning after warning after warning. But yet they kept going. And God said, because I am your God and because I'm a God of my word, here's the curses that I promise to you if you are to leave me. Now, we're going to bring this to resolution in Christ in a moment, but I want you to sit in this. 
His wrath against their sin is being poured out in full measure. And despite the fact that they are the chosen people, despite the fact that they've had all these warnings, and despite the fact that they have the, the covenant love of God, the nation has reached a tipping point where the, t- the, the scales of justice have now tipped against them. He has leveled them. He has scattered his people. He has ruined the holy city. Why? Because the center of the center of the center of the center of the universe is not Israel. And the glory, and as glorious the temple is, as mighty as the people were, and as amazing it was to have God dwell among them, they are not the central reality of the created order. Why? Because God is. And God was. And he still is. What they miss is the fact that they could be the chosen people under the covenant love of God. They could have God's presence among them. But if they left him, if they didn't worship him, then they were forgetting who he was supremely. And they were forgetting who they were as well. Do you know that's not just a problem for Israel in 586? That's a problem for us today in 2024. That we often forget who God is and who we are. And we treat him as just a friend that we can dodge their text messages and say, oh, I never saw it. That's not God. You and I are not the center of the universe. One of the stunning blunt realities that hardship brings is the reminder that we are not the center of the universe. I and you are part of a culture that is in rebellion against God and he is so holy and so righteous that the brokenness of the world and the brokenness of you and me declare every day that we are not the center, but he is. So in the Old Testament, if you were to point to a moment which would describe to you and show you an aspect of the holiness of God, you would point to 586 B.C., Lamentations 2. If someone in that day were to say later on, say, hey, can you tell me how God is holy? Somebody would say, did you hear it happen in the late 500s? So where is that point then in the New Testament? Where is that point where we see how bad sin is and how holy God is? Well, that place is the cross. It's in the cross that we see the wrath of God, the full wrath of God. What Israel received wasn't even what Christ received. We see the full wrath of God poured out. It is in the cross that we see the justified righteousness of God on display. Listen to these two New Testament verses. Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Here's another one. And this this verse puts it so starkly and speaks about Jesus in such a way that I would not be comfortable to speak about Jesus if it was not in the Bible. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we, you and I, in Christ, might become what? The righteousness of God. What does that mean? That Jesus came in our place, he became accursed, and the Father crucified his own son, crushed his son, in order that you and I and anyone else who puts their faith in Jesus, their sins will be wiped away totally, forever. Amen? Amen. It means that Jesus died a ghastly death. Why? Because of the holiness of God. The ability to be forgiven by a holy God is directly dependent on the significance and the sufficient sacrifice of Christ. God is able, according to Romans 3.26, to be both the just and the justifier, the one who has faith in Jesus. Meaning, he is able to pour out and execute his wrath upon sin while at the same time rescuing a people for himself. That's you and I in Christ. So it's not just that he forgives you of your sins, but he forgives you because he has poured out his wrath upon Christ. That's important. That's a central reality of the Christian faith. And there are many churches out there claiming that that is not true and they are a false church. And they should be marked and known and avoided. That might make you feel uncomfortable, but that's the point. You may be the recipient of grace because you are a follower of Jesus. But you need to know your sins were paid for. That that God's wrath was poured out upon someone else. That you received a righteousness that was not your own. That was bought for you, given to you. That you could never have earned on your own. You need to realize that someone else has paid your debt. And oh, what a debt did they pay, amen? 
What a debt he paid. It is in the crucifixion of Christ that we see the mingling of both mercy and holiness. The mingling of mercy and holiness. So my question is to you is, what do you feel when you think about grace? Do you feel the weight of not only being forgiven, but do you also feel the weight of Christ's righteousness resting upon you? It's a weight. How holy is God to you? How righteous is he to you? How precious is his glory to you? It should be so much because he went to the cross that God poured out his wrath upon someone else instead of you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. To save a wrench, a wrench like me. How holy is he to you? So when you read Lamentations 2, you need to ask yourself a few questions. And that is, how big is God's holiness and righteousness to me? How do I take my sin? Do I take it seriously? Have I trusted Christ for the forgiveness of my sins? And is my heart tuned for the glory of God? Those are important questions. You see, this is one very practical way that lamentations and really the category of lament help us dearly as believers. They tune our hearts to be aware of the glory of God. As we read in, 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 in this chapter, it reminds us that God is holy and we are not. It reminds us that he is righteous, that our culture is broken, that sin is a debt that must be paid for and cannot be swept under a rug. And there is a beautiful other side to this and the beautiful mercy that comes along through Christ. But the reality is, is that Christ's sacrifice is only meaningful and only necessary because of the problem of sin in the world and because the problem of a holy God with sin in the world. That's why it was necessary. Lament keeps the weight of God's glory at the forefront of our hearts and minds. So we're guided by it. Now, secondly, let me move on to sorrow and, and, and their plea. And these next parts are way quicker, I promise. <laughs> Verse 11, the tone and really the speaker almost shift and becomes personal. In, in verse 11, he says, My eyes are spent with weeping. My stomach churns. My bile is poured out on the ground because of the destruction of the, of the daughter of my people, because infants and babies faint in the streets of the city. This is emotional, clearly. And there's personal connection to this. Jeremiah is weeping and he's even sick to his stomach as he witnesses the tragedy that's going on around him. Jeremiah is deeply grieved. And this chapter is not just meant to inform you, it's meant to move you. Which is why he's talking about innocent children being caught up in this tragedy. They faint in the streets. They cry for hunger. And Jeremiah is sharing these things to move us by seeing what is happening in the city of Jerusalem. Because this moment, church, is not just meant to be studied. It's meant to be mourned. It's meant to be mourned. Think about the difference between two types of museums. You can go to the Natural History Museum in New York. And, and spend a lot of time there. I've been there many, many times. It's a wonderful museum. You'll see many things, and, and you'll learn many facts on a, on a broad range of subjects. But my experience, and I do apologize if there's kids in the room right now, but my experience at the Museum of, of, of Natural History in New York City was vastly different than my experience at the Genocide Museum in Kigali, Rwanda. Or Rwanda. Or the churches that we'd go visit that have been turned into museums because they invited the Tutsi people in there and they locked the doors and murdered them in a church. And they've left their bodies to lay there. And you can walk through those. And so these museums are not just meant to inform you, they're meant to inform you in order that you're moved by them. I'll never ex forget my experience at the, the genocide museums and those churches that we walk through as you walk past bodies and bloodstains in the floor just left there and you see human skeleton and bone. I was moved. I was disturbed. The museum did what it was supposed to do to remind us, never let this happen again. These passages, Lamentations 2, is not just meant to be studied. They're meant to be mourned. And that's what Lamentation is meant to do, is to move us. It's not just so you know facts about God. It's so you know what lies beneath and what lies above. And the warning here is strong. 
because the destruction was so widespread. It says at the end of verse 13, for your ruin is vast as the sea. Who can heal you? Right? The picture is bleak. We learn about the spiritual component when you look at verse 14. We find that the spiritual leaders in Israel, they weren't dealing with the sins of the people. They actually gave people, don't listen to those prophets. They don't know what they're talking about. And they started giving them misleading prophecies about God, what was saying, and oracles. And underneath the destruction of this city lied a very significant spiritual problem. Judgment has come because of sin. Do you know why this is, is why the regular gathering God's people on the Lord's day is important? Why the regular hearing of the word of God is so vital? Because over time, what happens is our souls and our hearts in the midst of living in this world begin to believe the lie that God is not that holy and I'm pretty good. We begin to think that my sin's not that bad after all. After all, so many people are doing it and doing worse things than me. So we need the regular dose of the blunt reality of the word of God to wake us up so we keep running back to Christ for mercy and grace. It's to remind us who we really are and who God really is. In many respects, the Lord's day is the wake-up day for us to awaken to who he is. Wake up! Pay attention! God is holy. The Spirit is saying that. Maybe that's what you're feeling even today as you're listening to the words. The Spirit of God is speaking to you saying, wake up, stop messing around, stop trifling. Do you know who you are dealing with? He is a holy God. And outside of Christ, you are left to stand before this holy God to deal with your sins on your own. And that will not fare well for you. Verse 15 and 16, we see that the enemies of Judah were rejoicing. And Jeremiah even puts the the words of Psalm 48.2 in the mouths of the Babylonian armies where it says, perfection of beauty, the city of perfection of beauty and the joy of all the earth. He's saying they're mocking God's promises, saying, hey, this is what they used to call themselves, the perfection of beauty, the joy of all the earth. Now look at them. Their city's crushed. God is gone. And they're destitute. They proudly act as if they were the ones that brought God's people down, as you see in verse 16. But verse 17 shows us that, no, it was God who ordered all this to happen. He is sovereign and in control. Do you know that the cross of Christ was not, and the crucifixion of Christ was not just something that God just allowed? Like, I'm going to send you my son, and then he goes, whoa, what are you doing with my son? No. No. Acts 2.23 says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. The judgment of God was poured out on his son, and it didn't happen by accident. God was on mission to provide atonement, and the sacrifice of his son was part of that plan. In the same way, it might feel that God has abandoned his people in Lamentations 2. Jesus himself experienced that when he was on the cross. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus experienced the greatest and most frightening sorrow in the entire universe, and that is separation from God. And the beautiful yet tragic irony of that moment is that in the cross, Jesus didn't just save you from your sins when you receive him. No, he saved you from the wrath of God. And when you stand before God, you will be clothed in the righteousness of Christ and you will see who you really are and who Christ really is and and you'll see what he has done for you and then all of eternity will be spent basking in the beauty of this redemption that you could have never earned or bought. Praise be to Jesus. This redemption came because Christ's kind grace to you and his redemption, his righteousness protects you from the holiness of of God, that if you were to stand before him in your sinful state, you would be annihilated. But yet you have a protection of another. You have the protection of Jesus Christ. And friends, I don't think we have the foggiest clue how big, wide, and vast the holiness of God is, but we see a glimpse of it in his word, and it's frightening. And it's so vast that he would crucify his own son because he loved you so much. And he wanted to bring you back to himself. Amen? So now lastly, as I close, the appeal. I'll get you out of here. 
The people's hearts and judgment are turned and they are crying out to God. We see in verse 18, their heart cried to the Lord, O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears stream down like a torrent day and night. Give yourself no rest, your eyes no respite. Arise, cry out a night at the beginning of the night watches. Pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands to him, uh, uh, hands to him for the lives of your children who faint in hunger at the head of every street. What happened is, in in the judgment and the discipline of God's people, they are now finally desperate. They now long for God and to hear from him. And I can't imagine that there, I can imagine that there might be some of you, maybe here in this room or watching online, that through the circumstances of your life, through the hardships of your life, you are finally desperate today, that maybe today will be the day that you open your eyes and listen to what God is trying to tell you. The Puritans called this, the holy hound of heaven is tracking you. He's after you. He wants to save you, redeem you. If you would just simply hear his voice, stop resisting and running your own way. This is what we see in our verses. The people of God start to appeal directly to God. Look at verse 20. Look, O Lord, and see with whom have you dealt thus. Should women eat the fruit of the womb, the children of their tender care? Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? What he's saying is from a cultural and societal standpoint, can't get any worse than that. The city is ruined. Many are dead. People are starving. It's destroyed. God has turned against his own people because of their sinfulness. And in verse 22, it says, You summoned as to a festival day my terrors on every side. And on the day of the anger of the Lord, no one escaped or survived. Those whom I have held and raised my enemy destroyed. So what we see is they're appealing right to God, crying out to him in the midst of this dark moment. And it's similar to where the prophet Habakkuk appeals to God and says, Remember, Lord, mercy in the day of wrath. In other words, listen to me very, very carefully. Especially if this is your first time in church in a while and you're saying, this is why I don't come. Because of crazy guys like that up there preaching this crazy stuff. I, don't want, you to under- I-, I want you to understand that God's goal here is to feel like an enemy. To get their attention so he could be their restorer. So what we see is a little slice of what God is like outside of Christ. But then there's this whole other piece, this whole other piece. In the cross, we see the punishment that we see here poured fully out on Christ for our sin. And then in the resurrection, we see the victory over grave. In the cross, we see God's utter wrath against rebellion of mankind. But in the resurrected Christ, we have a beautiful offering of justification to those who will put their faith in Jesus Christ. So here's the deal. If you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, let today be the day where you hear that he's brought you here to hear this particular message because God has been using all the circumstances of your life up until now to get your attention, to draw your eyes to himself. And if that's the case, you know it. You might feel like everywhere you have turned, you have been resisted. And I just want to tell you that if you are broken over your sin, if you're tired of running, if you're tired of being the captain of your own life and trying to make all these good decisions that end in the pit, if you're ready to trust Christ, why not do it right now? You don't have to pray a special prayer. Just talk to God. He knows you. He loves you. And that goes for you too. You who are in our chairs or watching online who are good at pretending to be a Christian. But you're utterly a fake. Today's the day. Turn to Christ. Stop going through the motions of church and experience his salvation truly. Let it change you. Why not simply say to him, Jesus, I'm done. I'm a sinner. I'm tired of being the captain of my own life. As Romans 10, 9 says, I confess with my mouth because I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord and you have raised him from the dead, oh God. Confess it. Why wait a moment longer? Or maybe I can ask it this way. What else do you need to hear? What else do you need to hear? And to you who are followers of Christ, some of you are right now maybe under something that you could describe as the discipline of the Lord. He's not disciplining you for your own sins because Jesus was punished for your sins. But maybe you feel what you could describe as the discipline of the Lord because in his kindness, he is bringing correction to you because he wants your attention. He wants to bring you back for your own good and his his good. Discipline is good. 
Right? You disciplined your kids, I hope, when you're raising them. And you who are raising them, I hope you do discipline them. Discipline is good because of love. And God wants to get your attention. So the pain and the struggle and the hardship of your life has served to awaken your eyes to who God is, to take your sin more seriously, to take God's glory more seriously with more respect. And the invitation to you is why not cry out for mercy now? Why not cry out for mercy now? We're running to all these other wells to find satisfaction. And Jesus is like, I'm the living well. I am the living water. Come and drink of me and I will satisfy you completely. Stop running to these broken wells that hold no water. So he disciplines you to bring you back. So why not cry out for mercy? I know you've come a hundred times and more to God. Forgive me, I need your mercy. But why not come again and again and again and again because he's an inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. He loves you. He knows you're a screw-up. It's okay. He loves you. He knows I'm a screw-up. And that's why he had to crush his son. Now, you don't abuse his mercy. You don't abuse his grace. That's a sermon for another time. But you run to him and you bask because you love him. And you're broken over your sins that you've committed against him. And that's the beauty of God is that he doesn't just leave you high and dry to try to figure out your life on your own way. No, he puts blunt stops in your life that make you think. He, doesn't, he loves you so much that he won't let you be the captain of your own ship. Amen? Amen? So finally, what this text reminds us, it's what every Christian should heed. It's the central focus of Lamentations 2, and that that is God is holy. And we should all heed that. Lament helps us to be reminded of that through the day-to-day life. As we lament over our sins and the sins around us, as we spend time just going there, we don't go there enough. And when we do that, we're going to walk out in the world and we're actually going to see temptations differently. If you struggle with a lot of temptations, lament is going to be your best friend. Dealing and looking at sin will be your best friend. Because you're going to see the brokenness around you as you look at the holiness of God. You're going to see the brokenness around you differently. Because it awakens your heart to God's holiness and the depravity of sin and it causes the lure of sin just to be a little bit less glossy. It causes the temptations and the strongholds in your life to be a little less gripping because you have basked in the brokenness of the world and the brokenness of yourself and in the holiness of God and you're going to walk out into the world with different eyes. I promise you that. After looking at Lamentations 2 today, you're going to walk out of this church looking at sin and the world differently. At least you should. Your hearts will be awakened. Your eyes will see things that you could not see apart from Lamentations 2. So this text, church, invites us to the sober warnings of our hearts that our hearts need to be tuned again and again and again and again to the glory of God. Just like we tune a piano, our hearts need to be tuned. And the beautiful thing about the image of what lament helps us and lamentations helps us do is remind us that even in the midst of all this pain and all this brokenness in the world, there is a sufficient Savior named Jesus standing there with arms open wide, ready to receive you, wipe you clean of all your sins and past failures and faults and put his spirit inside of you, clothe you in his righteousness and begin the journey of sanctification until you are one day glorified with Christ Jesus forever in heaven. Amen? What a glorious day that will be. So church, I ask this one last question. Your hearts need to be tuned to the symphony and holiness of God. So what song is playing in your heart today? The heart of Christ? Or the heart, or the, or sorry, the song of Christ? Or the song of the world? Let's pray. Father, I thank you, O Lord, for the tough passages of your scripture. And Lord, this is uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable for me. I think I wept more writing this sermon than I've ever wept writing any other sermon. Lord, it's uncomfortable to look at your holiness. But Lord, we know that there is a resolution to the punishment that hangs for sin. And that was your son who came, clothed himself in flesh, lived the life that I couldn't live or nobody else could live, and then he died the death that we should have all died, and he rose again so that everyone who put their faith in Christ would be born again, would be clothed in his righteousness, and we would be with you, Father, forever. 
Father, if any of them are here who are still trying to work out their own, work for their own salvation by trying to please you through a works-based understanding, Lord, may they see clearly today that there's no way to please a holy God except through your Son, Jesus Christ. And may we rest in that finished sacrifice. May we rest in that and live unto the good works that you have called us to. Not so we're more saved or get gold stars, but because we have been saved much, so, Lord, we can serve much. Father, we thank you, O Lord, that you loved us so much, as John 3, 16 says, that you didn't just leave us to stand before you alone to be crushed, but you sent your son to be crushed for us so that we could live. What a glorious reality that is. So, Father, I pray for us that you would help us, Lord, to be conformed more to the image of your son. And God, for those who here who have just been going through the motions of church but yet to know you, Lord, I pray that your spirit would be kind to them today. Open their eyes and their hearts. And Father, for those who hear who are against you, but are here, Lord, may you take their heart of stone and may you give them a heart of flesh. May you open their eyes to see the glorious truth that lies behind the sacrifice of your son, which is life with you eternally. Open their eyes, O oh Lord. Bring salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.